I'm ready. Uh, okay. So uh, welcome again, everyone. Uh, thanks for logging on and attending this program, uh, the history of the Cape Cod Canal. Uh, I want to also say thank you uh, and welcome back to those of you who attended the program the first time. Uh, my name is Matt Schumann. I am a programming librarian at Cary Library. Before we begin, just a few things to note. If you're having any technical issues, please let me know in the chat and I can try to help. Um, and this program is made possible in part by the generous donors to the Cary Library Foundation and people like you who attend our programs. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to now introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Samantha Gray. She is an interpretive park ranger with the US Army Corps of Engineer at the Cape Cod, engineers at the Cape Cod Canal. She's worked at the canal for 25 years where she manages the canal's interpretive services and outreach programs, as well as the Cape Cod Canal Visitor Center in Sandwich, Massachusetts. As an interpreter, Ms. Gray reveals the and relates the canal's unique history, features, and operations to people of all ages. For her work, she has been selected by uh, the USACE for multiple awards, including Regional Interpreter of the Year and the American Recreation Coalition's Legends Award. Uh, she earned her degree in conservation of natural resources from Long Island University. Now, without further ado, please welcome Samantha Gray. Matt, thank you so much for inviting me back. And uh, thanks to all of you for, um, for joining me this evening. I, um, I'm here to share with you a little bit about the Cape Cod Canal. Uh, tonight, we're going to touch a bit on the canal's history, on its operations, as well as some of the recreational opportunities we have to offer. Um, towards the end, I am going to invite you to uh, ask questions and to share any stories you may have. Um, Matt uh, gave a pretty good introduction uh, to who I am. Thank you for that. Um, for those of you that have met park rangers, you may have met them at national parks, at uh, state parks, or your local town parks. Uh, we work for all different agencies from the federal to the local level. We work in urban areas, in rural areas, and in everywhere in between. Um, but we do have one thing in common, or two things in common. Um, our job is to protect and connect. So no matter uh, where we work or um, you know what our park is like, who we work for, uh, we're hired to protect what's in our parks, whether that's natural or human made. Um, and we're here to protect the visitors to our parks and to connect with our visitors, what makes our parks so special. And that's what I do at the Cape Cod Canal. And the agency that I work for is the US Army Corps of Engineers. They're the organization that operates and maintains the canal. Uh, a little bit about our agency. We've been around since the time of the Revolutionary War, where our nation's engineering organization, um, and now it says US Army Corps of Engineers, I should make it clear, I'm not in the Army, I'm a civilian, and I'm not an engineer. I'll uh, talk maybe a little bit slightly like an engineer, but if you ask me any engineering questions, I'm sure you'll stump me. Um, our agency, like I mentioned, has been around since the time of the Revolutionary War. Our first engineering action was to build a uh, fortification at Breed's Hill. So that's the Battle of Bunker Hill. Um, in the 1800s, our agency was involved with the founding of West Point, which served as an, an, a military engineering academy. And then as the 1800s progressed, our country was growing and expanding. And the only trained engineers are um, our officials had at their disposal were military engineers. So Congress started authorizing the US Army Corps of Engineers to do civil works. And since then, um, our agency has grown and our missions have grown. Um, some of what we do is featured in this very busy slide, which I'm not gonna read all of. Um, but basically, if our agency has, um, if our nation needs, um, is in need of um, something for enhancing the economy, for strengthening our nation's security, um, helping to reduce the risk of disasters or to respond to them, the US Army Corps of Engineers might be involved. Um, we do have military and civil works missions. Uh, the civil works missions has a lot to do with uh, solving problems in our nation's waterways. 
whether that's trying to reduce the risk of flooding. Or in the case of the Cape Cod Canal, it has to do with navigation. Navigation is a really big mission of the US Army Corps of Engineers. You know, when we think of transportation infrastructure, what are we thinking about? You know, often we're in our cars, we're thinking of roads and bridges, we might be thinking of planes and trains, but how many people think of our navigable waterways? Um, there are 25,000 miles worth in our country and they're really vital for moving product as well as people around. Um, and our agency, the US Army Corps of Engineers plays a big role in making sure these waterways are um, safe for navigation. And why are waterways so important um, for transportation? Well, it's the most efficient way to move big, heavy stuff. So in the Cape Cod Canal, um, if you're gonna see large traffic moving through, there's a good chance you're gonna see a tug and barge unit. Um, these tug and barges that move through might be carrying something like automotive gasoline, say from a New Jersey, New York area to Boston. So um, we can then fill up our cars. But we could uh, truck all of that fuel to Massachusetts, but that would require a uh, little more than 350 tanker trucks on 995 versus just having one barge float up here. So you can kind of see um, that being able to float product um, is a way more efficient way to move it. Now of that, all those miles of navigable waterways, the 25,000 miles worth, the Cape Cod Canal is a 17.4 mile piece of this network. Um, the canal is a sea level waterway. That means there are no locks controlling the movement of the water. So the tides will determine how the height and uh, how high and low the canal goes and which way the current is moving through the waterway. The canal is 17.4 miles, like I said, but that's not the land cut. So the area where the waterway cuts through the land, that's about eight miles. The rest of it is approach channels and most of that being on the Southwest end in Buzzards Bay, a little bit on the Northeast end in Cape Cod Bay. And that's so we can guarantee water deep enough for the large vessels that use it. We want a waterway that's at least 32 feet deep by 480 feet wide. Now the main mission at the canal is to provide safe movement of vessels. By having the waterway where we have it, uh, it saves about 135 miles of coastal travel between New York and Boston. So that's gonna save time, that's gonna save fuel, um, that's going to save money. So there's a, 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 an economic benefit to having a canal in this location. Now, there are other missions at the canal the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is involved with. They're surrounding the waterway is a little bit more than 1,150 acres <coughs> excuse me, of federal land. And um, so U.S. Army Corps of Engineers hires park rangers like myself to achieve environmental stewardship missions um, to manage the natural resources on our lands, and also to develop those lands for safe uh, recreation. And we have about 3 million people that recreate along the canal every year. From our office, we are also responsible for two flood risk management projects. One is in New Bedford, and the other one is in Providence, Rhode Island. And these are hurricane barriers that, um, that are were built in the 60s and are maintained and operated today to prevent uh, tidal surges from moving into those cities. Now, this is a canal, it's not a river, so that means it wasn't always here. People constructed this waterway and we'll get into who those people were and how in, in just a minute. Um, but, you know, often a question is, what was here before? Um, well, this valley used to have two rivers flowing through it. On the northeast end, so that's the Cape Cod Bay end, um, used to be an extensive salt marsh and one of the tidal creeks that meandered through was called the Scusset River. On the southwest end, on the Buzzards Bay end, there was a, a larger tidal river called the Monument River. And that connected Buzzards Bay to a freshwater stream called Herring River that connects up to Great Herring Pond that sits in southern Plymouth and also a little bit touches into corn. So Cape Cod used to be attached to the rest of Massachusetts. 
Um, as the bird flies at high tide, there was about one mile of dry land separating these two rivers. And um, that dry land was no more than 30 feet above sea level. So a very tiny little strip of land, giving an idea of what these rivers look like. This is a view of the Monument River, pretty close to where the Bourne Bridge is today. So a much smaller tidal river. Um, so you think it would be pretty easy to dig a canal because there was only a short distance through. Well, it took about 300 years of talking about it before it became a reality. Now, to dig a canal, people wanted more than just for the shortcut. Another really big reason why people dug a canal through this location has to do with this image. You can see southeastern Massachusetts, there's Plymouth, here's Cape Cod, Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard. And all along the outer shores of Cape Cod are all these markings here. Each individual marking is a separate marine disaster or shipwreck. That's a lot. This one drawing shows 1,076 marine disasters. And that does not even touch the estimated 3,000 that historians believe occurred from the early 1600s to the early 1900s. So digging a canal through this valley right here between Cape Cod Bay and Buzzards Bay was more than just saving time and money. It was about saving lives and preventing the heartache that used to occur um, throughout the uh, 1700s and 1800s. Many people proposed a canal as early as the 1600s. The first engineering survey for a canal was during the Revolutionary War. Um, multiple surveys were done at the federal, state, and private level throughout the 1800s. There were even two attempts to dig a canal in this location in the 1880s. Um, all came to nothing until um, this, these people came along, August Belmont Jr. and William Barclay Parsons. August Belmont Jr. was a wealthy financier from New York. Um, he got involved with the canal project in 1904. And as a financier, he saw a lot of potential in digging a canal here. He had recently completed a big project with William Barclay Parsons in New York City, and that was to build the IRT or the Interboro Rapid Transit, the first subway system in New York. And, um, and they found success with that. And so Belmont brought on Parsons. Um, as somebody that could help make the Cape Cod Canal a reality. And after five years of securing financing, lands, and coming up with uh, uh, plans for the construction of the canal, the first shovelful began in 1909, um, right in that Borndale section, which was the dry area. And obviously these people in the background were not the people that actually constructed the canal. These were many of the investors that Belmont had recruited to finance the project. The work itself, um, a lot of it involved using dredges. So Parsons' plan originally was to use different styles of dredges and work from Buzzards Bay and Cape Cod Bay and, and just dig towards the middle. Um, two different style of dredges were employed. You had a mechanical dredge, which is basically um, a uh, something that floats with a big scoop on it and would scoop up the material, put it onto a scow, which is like a floating raft, uh, and that would get towed out to the bays and then um, uh, deposited at sea. And then there were hydraulic dredges, like the one in the lower left, where there would be a cutter head at the tip of a bar that would go down into the water down to the sea floor that would spin to loosen up the sand. And then in the middle of that uh, was a suction hose. So like a vacuum cleaner, it would suck up the sand. And then that material could be loaded onto a scow, but it can also be um, uh, piped off to the sides and deposited in the sides. And so Parsons had really hoped that by employing these different dredges working towards the middle, um, they'd be able to complete the project. But of course, they ran into a lot of problems, um, particularly um, boulders, glacial erratics. So Cape Cod was formed many years ago um, when glaciers started to retreat and left behind the backbone of what is now Cape Cod. 
It also left behind a lot of really large boulders, uh, some the size of a school bus. And so when you are digging underwater or digging land, um, it's really hard to get rid of these without blasting them into smaller pieces. And so digging the canal did require a lot of dynamite as well. Um, this really slowed down their progress, particularly in the water, um, because they had to wait for the right tide for the diver to go down, set the dynamite, clear the scene, blast, let things settle, and then repeat until they were down to the depth that they needed. So Parsons started to employ steam shovels to dig in the dry section in the middle. He um, uh, set up these um, earthen barriers, these dikes, so you had different workstations in the middle section, and then brought in the steam shovels to remove the material and then employed uh, railroad cars with tip Car, uh, 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 trains with tip cars um, that can move the material off to the side. Well, after five years of construction, um, opening day finally happened, and that was on July 29th, 1914. A lot of people wanted a canal for a really long time, so this deserves a really big celebration. It was a full day of boat parades, of land parades and ceremonies. Lots of dignitaries showed up for this. Um, and it was pretty exciting. Now, this, of course, made Cape Cod an island. So I should mention that Belmont's company did construct bridges as well. But they didn't look like the bridges that we have today. So the canal was completed in 1914. The bridges we have today were not built until the 30s. So this is what was here before. Um, we had drawbridges. Uh, Bourne Bridge was a rolling bascule double leaf lift bridge. What does that mean? There are counterweights on the bottom of these roadways. So it um, will be balanced when it tips up. Um, you have a steel substructure, but the roadway was oak planking. And you're gonna think in 1914, a lot of people didn't have cars. So um, on the Bourne Bridge, you actually had a trolley that would roll over between New Bedford and Monument Beach in Bourne. Sagamore Bridge, uh, very similar design. This one was set really close to a manufacturing facility that was there um, at the time called Keith Car Works. And that empl employed over a thousand people in the village of Sagamore. So it was really important that Belmont placed the Sagamore Bridge in that location so people can get back and forth between work, school, church, um, you name it. Um, during the construction, uh, temporary bridges would have to go in in the Sagamore location as well so people could get back and forth. Um, and then train bridge. Trains were really important at the time as well. So there was a lift bridge that would pivot to one side. Thing is with this canal, now Belmont built the canal not out of the goodness of his heart. He built it as a way to make money. This canal was a toll waterway and they had used it. Um, uh, you know, steamships had used it tugs pulling all sorts of like coal barges would use it. You'd have lots of passenger vessels and everybody had a different rate depending on their size and the type of vessel going through and the cargo they were carrying. Um, Belmont's Canal though never really realized the, um, uh, the profits they had hoped for because it had continual problems. The canal in Belmont's years, this fo aerial photograph was taken in the 1920s. It's very different than the canal we have today. It was more, it was narrower, it was shallower. You've of course had those draw bridges. And unfortunately that early canal had a lot of problems. You had problems with, with erosion, had problems with the mariners themselves just having a tough time negotiating the strong currents. There were multiple wrecks with the strong currents. Um, in this case, the steamship completely missed the opening of the Sagamore Bridge um, and crashed right underneath the approach. When things like this happen, that would close the canal, and in this case, the bridge. Um, with the canal closed, they're not generating revenue, and then that's less revenue going into maintaining the channel 
which started to um, experience some serious shoaling or shallowing because um, the sand kept eroding in. And then, you know, by the late 1920s, more people had cars and people uh, were complaining about all the backups of the drawbridges um, um, because more people had vehicles at that time. So ultimately, you had this failing canal. And what do you do when you have a failing canal? Um, but sell it to the U.S. government. And um, the U.S. government purchased the canal in uh, March of 1928 authorized under the River and Harbors Act of 1927, and they tasked the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers with, with fixing it. And so after um, um, surveying mariners that used it or would potentially use it and getting a long laundry list of problems, um, one of the solutions the Corps of Engineers came up with was to take Belmont's canal, which was originally 100 feet wide, was supposed to be 25 feet deep, more often it was like 18, um, and basically supersize it. Um, make it at least 480 feet wide by at least 32 feet deep. And also along the upper sides of the canal to place these rocks called riprap to help prevent the erosion that was occurring from the boat's wakes. So this way it make it easier to maintain this channel. Another problem that people had was not as was not about the land cut, but about the approach in Buzzards Bay. So originally Belmont's Canal had to take a series of turns to get in the land cut and, and tuck behind these two islands, Hog Island and Mashney Island. And um, mariners had a tough time with that. And so the Corps of Engineer looked at a way to um, to straighten that approach versus having one that used to bend through. Now, was all this going to work? Well, we employed um, through contract MIT to build a warehouse size model to study it before actually constructing it. And then um, construction, the widening and the deepening of the canal happened in the 1930s. During that time, the goal was to keep shipping open as much as possible during the construction. So the old sides of the canal were left in place while the new sides were dug behind there. A benefit of that is that in this area where it was dry, it made it easier for laying the riprap. And it also made it easier, you might notice in this photograph up here, the, the present day Sagamore Bridge was already constructed. So before the canal was widened and deepened in the latter part of the 30s, the bridges were constructed. And the funding for the bridges we have today came from the National Industrial Recovery Act of 1933. $4.6 million was put towards construction of the Bourne Bridge, the Sagamore Bridge, and the Railroad Bridge, as well as some maintenance dredging. And the whole goal of this was not only to you know, improve the waterway, but it was about putting people back to work. Um, about 700, a little more than 700 people were employed to construct the bridges. All in all, with the canal reconstruction, about 1,400 jobs were created. And these bridges were all built simultaneously. You had teams, two teams working on each bridge, um, and you'd have multiple shifts a day. The whole goal was, again, to get as many people employed as possible. I love this aerial photograph. It kind of gives you an idea of the scale from the old Sagamore Bridge right over here to the one we have today. Um, so we went from an opening for boats that was 140 feet wide to an opening 550 feet from pier to pier. So it's quite a big difference. Um, some of these buildings that are along the way between the bridges and beyond the old drawbridge was that Keith Car Works, um, which operated until 1929 when it shuttered its doors uh, for good. Um, There's just some really neat construction photos showing how the bridge was constructed. Uh, this one is the Bourne Bridge that we're looking at here. And at the same time those bridges were being constructed, we had the train bridge. 
the highway bridges moved a little bit from old location, new location based on where it was best for road uh, realignment and where there was elevation. Um, but the train bridge, the one we have today was constructed right next to Belmont's train bridge um, as a way to minimize how much track needed to be relocated. The train bridge itself was constructed from either side and it was only when the center section had to be constructed that the canal was closed to boat traffic. And that was, um, I think, five days total. That was it. They were able to complete that centerpiece and then lift the span for the first time. And those that uh, uh, alignment in Buzzards Bay that I mentioned earlier that uh, we wanted to do, I kind of like this. Um, on the photo on the left, this is Mashney Island. And then you can see Hog Island almost cut it, pretty much cut in half. The very tip of it was here. And you can see most of it is already cut away. Um, the old canal used to come in behind here in Finney's Harbor. Um, when this was completed, this was all cut out. And then this channel was dredged. These islands were connected um, to allow for a nice straight approach in. This is the beginning of something called Stony Point Dyke, and that's a two mile long sand spit um, off of the, um, uh, in Wareham to allow for, help allow for that straight approach. Um, so pretty much by 1940, the waterway that, that we have today was completed, meaning a waterway that's at least 480 feet wide by 32 feet deep with the three bridges we see today. Um, and the, um, um, the straight approach through Buzzards Bay. Now we fast forward from 1940 to today for the sake of keeping this presentation for under an hour, what do we have today? We have about 15,000 vessels that go through the canal every year. That is a mix of small pleasure craft to, uh, to large tankers and car carriers. Um, by far the number one type of commercial traffic we see our tug and barge units, like the center photograph that we see um, right here on the screen. Today, when I was working for my large traffic, yeah, I saw two tug and barge units. I saw a Coast Guard buoy tender, which I saw three tug and barge units, I think. Um, lots of small pleasure craft and some fishing vessels. Um, the auto, the car carriers are very impressive to see. I don't know if you've ever seen those up close. But just to kind of give you an idea of size, um, it's really hard to see in this photograph just how tiny the people are on shore. So a car carrier, imagine a parking garage that has a capacity of 5,000 automobiles and then having that float by you. That, that's how big they are. Um, they're really impressive to see. So how do we make sure they're going to come through safely? Well, uh, first way is to make sure our channel is as wide and as deep as we say it is. So we do survey the canal regularly to um, uh, check its depth. We use side scan sonar for that. And then um, when it is not as deep as we say it is, we will post a notice to mariners. And actually we have that out now. There's a couple of areas that there is some shoaling. So it's not 32 feet at mean low tide. Um, and then we'll manage vessel, vessel traffic accordingly. And then, um, and then we'll work towards getting some dredging done. And so I believe we'll actually have some dredging coming up this winter. And the last time we had dredging, we had um, a hopper dredge just like this one, where this arm would go down uh, and like a vacuum cleaner would suck up the sand. It would go right into this hopper right here. And then last time we dredged, and I'm pretty sure it'll be the same this time, um, the dredge then moved out into Cape Cod Bay connected to a pipe and then deposited the material um, along Town Neck Beach to help replenish the beach that is there. Now, we also manage vessel traffic through. So some of my coworkers are marine traffic controllers. From this facility, which is located on Academy Drive in Buzzards Bay, we have around the clock monitoring of the entire waterway of all vessel traffic any vessel that's over 65 feet in length does have to ask permission to transit. 
they'd be contacting our marine traffic controller who uses all sorts of technology from radar and cameras and something called AIS. That's an automatic identification system where the vessels are you know, transmitting out signals themselves. Um, all this information is integrated with tide and weather information. And basically the controller makes a decision on when a vessel can come through, uh, how fast we want them to go through. We're looking at things that are they going to fit? Um, some vessels are so big, they might be tide dependent on whether or not they'll fit underneath the bridges or fit with their deep draft. We're going to look at where vessels are going to be passing each other. We do allow uh, tug and barge units to pass each other, but we just have some no passing zones like underneath uh, the bridges. So th that needs to be coordinated as well. Um, we do take into account weather as well, depending on the type of product that goes through. Um, there might be some minimum visibility requirements. Now, if the controllers need, um, we have our patrol boats out on the water. These are some of my coworkers here operating these patrol boats. They can render assistance to vessels that need it. They assist a lot of small of the small boat traffic through the canal. Um, they're inspecting the waterway every day. They're enforcing various rules and regulations. Um, they also go out when the railroad bridge lowers. So this bridge will lower anywhere from zero to six, maybe seven times a day, depending on, on the time of year and the day of the week. Um, so this time of year, we start seeing more uh, train traffic um, as well as boat traffic. So more coordination needs to be done. The train's normally in the resting position, but when it does lower, our patrol boat will go out upstream and um, and just you know make sure small boat traffic uh, stays a safe distance away for the large traffic well that's the job of the marine traffic controller they're not going to let that that bridge lower um, if there is large traffic already committed to the waterway if we know a passenger train is coming um, the controller will coordinate the movement of large traffic to make sh ship traffic to make sure that they are not in the waterway when, when a passenger train needs to go over. Um, this bridge is really neat. I don't know how many of you have ever seen this operate. Vertical lift means, you know, it goes up and down. So the span is normally in the raised position because ships have right away. And then when a um, train comes, the train calls the bridge operator who also works for the US Army Corps of Engineers. They call the Marine Traffic Controller. Once everything is cleared, then um, the span could be lowered. It takes about two and a half minutes for that entire span to lower. That weighs 2,200 tons. Um, train will go over another two and a half minutes for that 2,200 tons to go back up. Um, it moves super efficient, less than a dollar in electricity for a round trip move. And how do we move so much weight? Well, it's really just one giant simple machine when you look at it. Um, the center span is counterweighted by these um, weights right over here suspended in the tower. These are concrete filled steel, each one 1,100 tons. So together they equal the same weight as the center span. Um, they're connected by cables that wrap around these giant shivs or pulleys in each tower. So think of it like the old windows in our homes that have the counterweights hanging in the sills. It moves the same exact way. When the shift spins, span goes down, weights go up, and vice versa. Now, along the waterway, um, there's a lot more besides the rangers, marine traffic controllers, and boat operators out there. There's a lot to help keep things moving, um, like our electricians, for instance. We're a 24 hours a day operation. So how do mariners make it through the canal safely at night? Well, every 500 feet, there's a light pole um, those lights are different colors around the curve, so you can see which way it bends. There's lights on the bridges, including way up top, so planes don't fly into them. So a few of my coworkers are high voltage ele electricians, and it's their job to distribute power throughout the canal and make sure it's lit for a 24-hour day operation. Um, now most people know the canal for this, for the recreation. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we have about 3 million people that recreate along the canal every year. Um, many people are drawn to our service roads. Those are the paved paths that line the waterway. There's 13 and a half miles worth. 
The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers built them and maintain them so we can take care of the navigation infrastructure. We invite the public to recreate along them as well. Um, they provide for great access for biking, walking, running, as well as access to shoreline saltwater fishing. Um, boats aren't the only ones taking a shortcut through the canal. We have a lot of fish in the canal as well. Um, and then we have multiple day use areas along the waterway where people can picnic, you know, park, use the restroom facilities. Um, there's two campgrounds along the canal that are offered through a lease to the state as well as to the town of Bourne's Recreation Authority. And then there's lots to do like with ranger programs or in the case of where I'm, I'm talking to from, I'm, I'm talking to from the Cape Cod Canal Visitor Center located in Sandwich. Um, this is an old Coast Guard boathouse that we turned into a museum. We have exhibits indoors and outdoors. We have films on the construction of the canal and we offer a variety of ranger led programs here, spring, summer and fall. Um, this year we're open um, Tuesday through Saturdays um, through October 22nd. Sundays will be open um, in July and August will be open on Sundays too. And what's great with this is that this museum is free. So if you find yourself in the area, swing on in and check it out and bring the family with you. Uh, now, I definitely wanted to not go too over. Oh, I forgot I was going to talk about this. Um, so when you come to the canal, uh, you're probably going to cross a bridge. A lot of people, when they think of the canal, they think of the bridges. Um, these are iconic structures. They were completed in 1935. Does that make them 87 years old uh, this year? Um, they're up there in age. Um, so how do we make sure that they're safe? Well, we have engineers that are doing head to toe inspections on those bridges. And based on the findings of those inspections um, and also based on recommended maintenance schedules, we do maintenance. Everything from, uh, uh, painting and steel repairs and concrete work. There's electrical upgrades, expansion joint work, bearings so thing, the bridge can flex when it needs to. And then once every 50 years on average is the big maintenance. And they call that a major rehabilitation. And I don't know if anyone was in the canal area in the late 70s and early 80s, but that's when our bridges went through and about, they were almost 50 years old at that point, a major rehab. And that's what, this is what a major rehabilitation looks like. It's not just basic painting or whatnot. And during this rehabilitation, this is of the Bourne Bridge, um, they removed the entire roadway, the, the decking that supports the roadway, did maintenance repairs on the stringers and the beams. Um, there was all sorts of concrete work done um, it was at this time the suicide uh, prevention or um, deterrence barriers went up. Um, prior to that, they just had low railings along the sides. Um, they did the Sagamore Bridge between 79 and 81, and then immediately after completed, I mean, they did the Bourne Bridge and then completed the Sagamore Bridge after. Um, this is pretty big work, huge work. And back then they hang a sign that said Bourne Bridge closed detour to Sagamore. I couldn't even imagine doing something like that today. But here we are coming up on a, close to another 50 years beyond that, and that is the recommended time to do a major rehab. Well, that's big money, that's major work. So we did a study to determine whether or not we should do another rehabilitation, or is it best not to do anything at all or best to replace them? What's the best way forward? So this was a multi-year engineering um, study and the report on the study was published uh, in April 2020. And in that report, uh, it was recommended that the most responsible way forward for the next hundred years is to, um, to replace the two highway bridges that we have. And, um, and um, it's estimated it's gonna be about a billion dollar project um, it's recommended that these new bridges meet modern highway standards versus the 1930s standards um, under which they were constructed. So that includes your through lanes, merge lanes, shoulders, dividers, and also, you know, separated uh, pedestrian slash uh, bicycle path. 
Um, so what has happened since this recommendation came out? Well, in June of 2020, the US Army Corps of Engineers signed a memorandum of understanding an MOU with Massachusetts uh, Department of Transportation, um, who simultaneously was doing an engineering study on all of the roads in the canal region and how to improve multimodal transportation in our region. Well, under this MOU, Mass Department of Transportation is going to take the lead on redesigning bridges and roads. Um, and, uh, and so from that point forward, uh, Mass DOT already started the public process with public information meetings. They've done an enormous amount of studies and data collection. Um, the last few months, they were doing subsurface borings, uh, you know, so drilling down to bedrock um, to determine, you know, where that is um, around the bridges. Um, and they've been doing a lot with public outreach. Um, so where are they at? Well, the best thing to do is check out mass.gov and just do a search on mass.gov for the Cape Cod bridges and you'll get right to their page and they can give you kind of an update on what they've been up to. You can comment on a few, um, a few things they have open right now and you can sign up to get an alert when they have um, any sort of major milestones or when they're going to do their next public information meeting. The last I looked, they said sometime this summer or the fall will be the, the next information meeting. So definitely worth checking out if you're interested on the future of our bridges. Now, um, if you want to know more about the Cape Cod Canal, I do have my email right here on the screen. Um, we do have a Facebook page, Cape Cod Canal Visitor Center. So I'll post uh, any programs that we're gonna be offering there. And we also have our website, capecodcanal.us. We'll link you uh, right there. Um, at this time, I, I wanna open up um, if to anyone who might have a question. Um, and so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen right now so I can see the chat box or, um, I don't really know how questions work. I, I will. Uh, I can feed them to you. We have a couple of questions so far, and anyone else who has um, questions, feel free to submit them via the Q and A. Um, okay. So uh, the first question is: How many bridges were there prior to the 1930s? Sure. So over the original Cape Cod Canal, there were three bridges. Uh, there was a Bourne and Sagamore drawbridge and there was a bascule uh, style train bridge. Before that, there were small little beam style bridges that went over the rivers. Um, and how often do they dredge the canal? Mm -hmm. um, so let's see, last time was 2016. So this winter will be 20, 23, 4, 5, 6, 7. I, it, was, it will be seven years in between the last one. I would say six years is more of an average. Uh, and, when, and when they dredge, it's generally spot dredging versus having to dredge the whole waterway. There's usually maybe a handful of areas that need it, but not the entire waterway. Yeah. Um, another question is, um, they don't, this person doesn't know how to get to the uh, recreational paths along the canal, where are the access points? Sure, that's a great question. So um, I do have a map. Um, if you go to capecodcanal.us, um, that will link you to our home page, and then you'll be right where they have recreation and you can start clicking there for maps. But we have multiple areas on the mainland side and on the Cape side. So if you're on the mainland side, um, there are some of the easier ones to find uh, would be off of Main Street and Buzzards Bay by the base of the train bridge. And then there's one um, right along the scenic highway near the Herring Run Recreation Area. There's a traffic light there, so you can pull right into the parking lot. Great. Um, another question is, uh, this person loves the Cape Cod Canal Visitor Center. And they love that it's free. Um, how often do the exhibits or interpretive signage change and get updated? <laughs> uh, thank you so much for that. Um, how often do they change? Uh, not as often as they probably should. 
<laughs> so um, I'm sorry for that. I have very limited updated stuff, though I, I don't know the last time that you've been in here. Um, the last big change um, was the last year we were open for real. Um, before COVID, which was 2019. And with that, we got a bunch of new exhibits through a partnership with Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries, who set up some exhibits on the fish that use the waterway. Neat. There's another question that just came in. Um, are there any issues you face with drug trafficking along the canal? Um, so U.S. Army Corps of Engineers are not the law enforcement side of things. We're more the infrastructure side. So um, I am unaware <laughs> um, because it, I, so I, I haven't heard of any of that. Um, and if it does exist, it uh, it's, would be law enforcement or Perhaps you know, um, you know, if it's a federal agent, another federal agency, maybe the Coast Guard would have gotten involved if it has to do with um, something coming on and off the boats. But, sorry, I don't have any stories about that. Um, someone asked, "How do the specifications for the Cape Cod Canal compare to the Panama Canal?" Uh, that's a good question because the Panama Canal just had a, um, a their uh, like a major reconstruction. Um, so I don't have it memorized how big their locks are now. Um, but Panama Canal, since the reconstruction, can take I think pretty much the largest vessels that exist, and we cannot. We have some constraints. Um, we can't take anything. We're we're 32 feet at Mimo tide. Um, our vertical clearance is 135 feet, and because of the curves in the canal, we don't take anything longer than 825 feet. So have to do a Google search on um, on the constraints of the locks for the Panama Canal because that's what would uh, constrain the size for them. Interesting. Um, another question just came in and someone asked, do the sea mammals use the canal like seals and whales? Sea mammals do use the canal. Um, I, we just, I think it was yesterday. I was off yesterday, um, but I believe we had um, right whales in the canal yesterday. Um, we do see whales in the canal. Um, North Atlantic right whales being critically endangered. Um, do require special attention and the, the canal gets shut <laughs> um, to large traffic if there is anything there. There's a multi-agency effort to monitor every single individual feeding in Cape Cod Bay um, and to keep track on who might be in or moving through the shipping channel. But I've personally seen, seen right whales, humpback whale, I've seen pods of Atlantic white-sided dolphins. Uh, we see harbor seals and gray seals. Um, everybody's basically filling their belly. So, um, so yeah, we see them come through. Um, and are there already um, noted effects from climate change on the canal or do, are there uh, anticipations of what climate change might do to the canal? Um, so climate change, um, I have, you know, I, I, I probably should be more up on, you know, any sort of modeling specific to the canal or the other structures that we're responsible for. Um, uh, but personally, I'm not, I know as an agency, every action that they're taking now does take into account, uh, climate change, sea level rise. Um, and so any new construction, any, you know, uh, long-term planning um, does incorporate that. Um, so now too, even when we're looking for funding for work, like what can we do uh, for resiliency um, as well as sustainability and improving our infrastructure. Um, but I don't have specifics for you, even though uh, that's a great question. Uh, a couple more questions came in. Um, 
One is the Cape Flyer Train Management hoped to add a Saturday round trip last year, but the Army Corps refused the extra Saturday vertical lift bridge movements. Could you explain why? Um, I'm not really sure why, because a lot of negotiations for the movement of the bridges, for the use of the train, um, you know, is kind of uh, beyond what I'm doing in, in the Ranger section. So I, I really can't speak to that. Um, so I'm sorry, I can't shed any light on that. And then um, someone asked, you spoke about preventing shipwrecks as one motivation for building the canal. Have there been any major wrecks or disasters since the modern canal opened? Um, yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, there have been shipwrecks that have occurred, um, you know, um, since since the canal is open because not everybody uses the canal. I, I don't I, I don't have them memorized, so I can't I can't tell you. Um, we've had shipwrecks in the canal since it's open too. Um, probably, um, well, everyone always wants your story. So he, here's one that dates back to World War II. Um, we had a coal carrier going through the canal um, and it um, it hit the north bank or the mainland side and went perpendicular and sank. And this is during World War II where the canal was really critical for movement. Um, um, this, the name of this was the Stephen R. Jones. Um, so they removed as much coal as they could. Um, the wreck was end of June 1942 and on the 4th of July 1942, they blew it up to get rid of it. And throughout, <laughs> throughout the July, they just continued to disintegrate it um, until we were back to 32 feet. So if you wanna see the porthole for that, um, that is in a display case that's right behind me. So when you come and visit me at the visitor center, you can see that from the Stephen R. Jones. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, uh, wrecks still happen, um, but technology we have today makes a huge difference on marine safety, so a lot less. And you got to think a lot of the wrecks that happened in the 1800s, there was a lot of shipping, there was no satellite weather to tell us when storms were coming, no radar to help us see in the fog, no sonar to help us um, uh, check out the depth of the waterway. So all this, a lot of this technology now really help improve the safety of shipping around the Cape. Very interesting. Well, thank you so much, Samantha. This was uh, incredible, and I'm glad that we got to actually do the program this time. Oh, someone just submitted uh, one more question, if you have time for one more. Yeah. Um, do submarines still go through the canal? That's interesting. I don't, I don't remember the last time a submarine has gone through the canal. Um, <laughs> I haven't, I haven't seen one. And I feel like the last one I saw, I mean, not, I'm not here every day and I'm not monitoring traffic every day. So I, I can't tell you. Um, but I feel like the last one I saw wasn't even like functional. It was an old like um, Russian sub that was towed through as a, as a movie prop <laughs> than actually operating on its own. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't think so. That's very interesting. All right. Well, thank you so much. I, I enjoyed it and I hope to see you down at the canal one day. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you everyone for coming. All right. Have a good night.